Okay, we're back. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Williams from Watchmen, Derek C. in France from I Know This Much Is True, Nichelle Tramble Spellman from Truth Be Told, Ellen Paul from The Eddie, and Paul Sims from What We Do in the Shadows. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, for being part of this. Um, Thank you. Hi. And um, let's just let's just start with a basic question for people who may have seen these clips but haven't seen more of the shows. Um, why don't we just go around and, and tell us a little bit of, a, a little bit more about your show and and how you came to be involved with it? Why you wanted to be part of it? Um, Alan, you want to start since you're sure. next to me here on the screen? <laughs> okay, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, the Eddie was a, a project very close to my heart that took a, a really long time to gestate. Um, it started, it, it kind of developed in a very organic way, but kind of backwards from the way that shows usually are. Um, Glenn Ballard, the great producer and composer, came to me in 2013 and said, uh, here, I've written a suite of songs and I want to make a show about a jazz club in Paris. And the songs were amazing, but that was pretty much it. And so uh, from there, I said, okay, jazz club in Paris. So I went to Damien Chazelle, who I knew from Whiplash was interested in jazz. I knew that he was half French and had grown up partly in Paris. Uh, and then Damien went off to make La La Land. So he brought in Jack Thorne to write the script. So it kind of went song, location, characters, and then story at the end. So as befits that, it's a, it's an eight episode series about a jazz club in Paris and the band that plays there and the people in their lives. Um, but it has a, a very loose, and as you could see in that scene, improvisational feel that is trying on every level to kind of, uh, not mimic, but to kind of resonate with the unusual extemporaneous energy of jazz. Mm -hmm. is, is that why you wanted to be part of it? Uh, I wanted to be part of it because I fell in love with Glenn's songs and I love Paris and just to be, uh, I said it was worth trying to build something around these songs and this idea and then, you know, being there from the beginning is always the most fun. Yeah. Okay. Stephen, tell, tell us what, what brought you to, you know, tell us a little bit about Watchmen and, and what, what brought you to it. Uh, Watchmen is a reworking of uh, one of the great graphic novels of the 20th century, also uh, called Watchmen. And um, it had had a previous incarnation as a feature film uh, made by Zack Snyder. Uh, and then Damon Lindelof, whom I had worked with uh, a lot before on a show called Lost that we did uh, in the early 2000s, uh, had, you know, loved this comic book ever since he was a kid. And uh, he had been introduced to it by his father and um, it influenced and informed his own personal approach to storytelling uh, for the screen and uh, influenced Lost a lot in terms of flashbacks and um, and structure. And, you know, Damon, as I understand it, had been approached many times by various parties, HBO among them, to do a version of that story utilizing some of the characters and obviously the the canon and the history of the, of the piece. And it wasn't until fairly recently when he read um, an essay by Tanahese Coates called The Case for Reparations that had been printed in the Atlantic uh, that he figured out for himself a way that would be satisfying to rework that material and to interweave it with uh, an examination, a dramatic exploration of uh, the ways in which uh, white supremacy and race uh, are intertwined in American history, present culture. Um, and, you know, obviously because he and I had worked together before in the past when he approached me about, with the, with this idea and I read the material, um, it was powerful and relevant and rich in a multiplicity of ways. And so it was a, it was a no brainer to kind of sign on. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Derek, I mean, tell us, tell us a little more about, I know this much is true and, and why you wanted to do it. 
Uh, well, it goes back a number of years. Uh, I mean, Mark Ruffalo had always been one of my favorite actors. Uh, when I first saw You Can Count On Me, I don't know when that was, 2003, 2004, I was in maybe the sixth year of trying to make my film Blue Valentine. And when I saw that film, I said, okay, that's a perfect guy to play Blue Va in Blue Valentine. So I sent him the script and I just never heard anything back from him. Um, just complete and utter rejection from Mark <laughs> Ruffalo's camp. Oh, and you had um, to fall back on Ryan Gosling. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was before I ever knew Ryan Gosling. You know, I had never heard of Ryan Gosling before. So I, anyway, I eventually made the right film with Gosling and Michelle Williams. And then I was at Sundance, and I, and Mark also had a film in Sundance in 2010, and we were like in the same director's class. And I basically told him that I didn't hold a grudge. I didn't hold it against him. I still loved him. And, uh, and if, and, and we just kind of formed an, an instant kind of bond. We just felt like brothers. Um, and so we always thought we would try to find something to do together. And he had maybe six years ago, got the rights to this Wally Lamb novel called, I know this much is true, which had, you know, Wally had optioned this back in like 98, uh, and tried to get it made into a feature film, but it's a thousand page novel and it's, yeah, it's just impossible to turn into a two-hour film. Um, and Wally's dream actor for it was Mark. And once Mark got the rights to it, Mark called me and and asked if I was interested in working on it and making it. And, you know, all the films I make are about families and about secrets held within families and kind of reckoning with, with personal legacy and uh, uh, kind of a view of uh, the bond and the burden that comes uh, that comes with being a family member, and so it felt like something I was born to make. And uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's how I came in, in touch with it. Right, Nichelle, what what made you want to do Truth Be Told? And tell us a little more about that story. Well, Truth Be Told started out as a novel by Kathleen Barber called Are You Sleeping? And um, I did a general meeting at Chernin because I'd worked with one of the execs there before. And on the way out, she said, oh, here's a novel that you might want to take a look at. And that was Christmas uh, 2017. Yeah, Christmas 2017. And I took it home and read it and liked the idea of sort of um, exploring crime from the point of view of victims and what the ripple effect is in, in um, family when there's a tragedy that sort of lasts for generations. And I was also interested in the idea that we've become so addicted to you know true crime stories and very few of them spend time with the victim's family and they're just they seem to be almost an afterthought so i thought if we lived in that space that would be interesting and then live with the reporter who's basically opening up an old wound wound in these people's lives and what that does so that was the the idea that we started playing with and octavia came on board pretty early she's a huge true crime fan and so we sort of bonded over the fact that um, her and her sisters watch snap marathons at Christmas and so do mine. And then that just sort of broke the ice between us and we kept going from there. Um, and that's what we all set out to do, just to not do a straight whodunit, but look at all the families involved in these uh, tragic cases. Mm -hmm. all right. So Paul, uh, how, did, how did what we do in the shadows go from from a one-off movie to to a TV series, and why why did you want to be involved? Well, first of all, did anybody who was watching those clips at the beginning get the sense that I don't belong here because <laughs> you guys are doing such powerful, <laughs> elegant shows, and ours ended on a fart joke. Our clip package. Um, I it was guess a really good fart joke. Though. It was a good one, but still, I, I I feel like I should be sitting at the children's table in this. Uh, um, no, uh, Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi made uh, really just scrabbled together and made their own uh, original, the original movie, which was a, for anyone who hasn't seen it, is a fake documentary about vampires living in the real world. Um, and I had worked with Jermaine and Taika both on what we, on uh, uh, Flight of the Concords <clears throat> 10 years ago. And when Jermaine said that they wanted to make a TV show version, I was interested. And I guess as far as wanting to be involved, I, I've, uh, it's been a while since I worked on something that was just pure silliness, which was to me the appeal. I mean, I I worked on Girls for a few years and I helped get Atlanta started. 
and I love those shows, but it's been a while since I worked on something that has zero redeeming value beyond uh, <laughs> fart jokes like the one you saw and other silliness. Right. I, I think in these times, um, silliness is a redeeming value. Uh, I, I hope so. Right. Well, let me let me go back to, to Derek and, and Michelle, because you're both working from a novel. And, and I know in both cases, you know, you changed some things about the novel. You kept some stuff. You you didn't keep other stuff. How do you how do you judge, you know, what what belongs and when you should move away from from the source material when you're working from a book? Well, you know, with Are You Sleeping, um, the podcaster who's at the center of the show was a minor character in the book. And it was told from the point of view of the twins who are played by Lizzie Kaplan on the show. But that would mean that it was very closed ended if we just followed that. And then once we had Octavia on board, um, of, of course, that was the lead character come to life. But we also had to change her race. So then what happened there is that we created the backstory and built a family around her with Ron Cephas Jones, Michael Beach and Tracy Toms. So we basically had the spine of the novel, the basic story that we wanted to tell with the mystery. And then it sort of bloomed from there based on casting, based on the fact that we wanted to have a little more longevity. Mm -hmm. All right, Derek, for you. Yeah. Um, well, it all starts really with uh, Wally Lamb who wrote you know, this, this amazing book that I was a fan of that was on my mother's shelf for, for 20 years, I always saw it back there. I was always intimidated by the sheer size of the novel. When Mark gave it to me, it took me a long, long time to read it because I'm very, very slow as a reader. But then I had a meeting with Wally and Wally gave me the trust, I guess, and the creative license to make it my own. Um, and if he hadn't have done that, I don't know what I what place I would have had in the process necessarily, because, you know, I was, it was going to be a six part series. You know, it was, you know, I ended up writing 371 pages adapted from this novel. That was a 900 page novel, uh, you know, adapting something from literature to the screen. It isn't a one-to-one -one ratio, you know, they're, they're two different, they're, they're different mediums, they're different languages. So there's a, there's part of it, which is a curation process. Uh, part of it is a subtraction process, but then it's also what Wally gave me was the ability to kind of project my own fears and fantasies and psyche into the, into the piece. And it really became one of the most personal films that I've ever made. Uh, and it was based on someone else's work, but I also had a, I also understood it on such a deep level. Cause I come from Italian American family. I'd only seen like gangster movies for Italian Americans, but that didn't represent how, how I grew up as a, as a kid that didn't represent kind of this masculine identity that, that was uh, kind of foisted upon me as, as my whole life. And so I really wanted to just confront that and deal with it. And Mark had the same thing. And so it just became honestly, just like effortless uh, to do it. It just felt like I knew it so well. And like I said, Wally allowed me the, the, you know, the privilege and the space to create. And, you know, uh, it's different than the novel, but it's inspired by it. So to me, it's the same, same story, same heart, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, for, for Stephen and, and Paul, I, I feel like you don't have source material in the sense that there is a story laid down, but you have a world that was created in, in another work that you, that you're now working in. So, you know, like Stephen, for, for Watchmen, how, how influenced are you by the visuals, the style of the original graphic novel? We were very influenced. Um, you know, we thought of the original graphic novel as canon, as the, we referred to it internally as the Old Testament. And what we were doing was roughly akin to the New Testament. So, uh, it was a very solid foundation narratively and visually, but uh, obviously we then kind of took it into in completely uh, new 
and uh, unfamiliar <laughs> territory, I think. Um, and we just we, we ultimately used the platform of the graphic novel as a springboard to jump into, uh, in some cases, extending uh, our awareness and our understanding of characters that had existed within the context of the graphic novel, and in other cases, to evolve them, change them, bend them, twist them to our uh, to our own design. Um, but it was certainly great to, we were very aware of, uh, you know, resting on the shoulders of the legacy of, of such a, an esteemed and, uh, highly regarded literary property. But, um, ultimately I think that we were not hamstrung by it. It was wind at our backs. Mm -hmm. Right. Paul, for you, I mean, did you feel wedded to to the style of, of the original film the, the style of the original film was so uh worked so well adhering strictly to documentary rules you know not having close-ups where you would ordinarily want a close-up really saying it's all we're only capturing what a documentary crew could capture um and just the even though our entire cast for the the television version is all new people and different vampires living in staten island instead of new zealand um just the general tone and the vibe were uh very well established but i also want to talk for a second about steven's episode of watchmen which after i watched it i went back and looked up who directed it and i am beat him immediately because it was the best thing i've seen on television in five or ten years uh, directorially and especially the way the transitions and how it moved from scene to scene really captured the spirit of the graphic novel in a way that most attempts to do comic book things don't do. So uh, no offense to anyone else, but I, I did want to say something nice about that because I loved it. I was really blown away by it. That's very kind of you, Paul. And uh, yes, if you are wondering, Paul is in fact on my payroll. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, clearly worth every penny. <laughs> Well, I do want to get back to that episode, Stephen. But first, first, I, I want to ask Alan because you're not you're not dealing with you know something that already existed. You're taking your inspiration from jazz music and from a setting. You you mentioned that you wanted the show to have the feel of jazz. But how did that translate as you were as you were trying to figure out what this would look like, what it would feel like? Well. It was so exciting to build this world essentially from scratch with you know a dozen songs at our back and um one of the things we knew going in was that we wanted to show paris as it is now uh, you say you're going to do a show set in a jazz club in paris and everybody says "Ooh, 40s ooh, 60s n n we i never had anybody think that the show was contemporary when i told them what the show was about uh, but what we wanted to do was show Paris today that is the the, the multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual, multi-faith Paris, which is really what Paris is. It's not those, you know, five or six little arrondissements in the center of the city that the tourists go to. So uh, so we really wanted to explore a Paris that we as, you know, three Americans and a Brit didn't really know that well. And uh, there was a lot of research done in building the world and Jack created the character of Elliot that Andre Holland plays as this incredibly um, conflicted person who could then be the wellspring of the of the tension that pervades the show. As someone who's a brilliant musician who's undergone uh, severe trauma a few years back and has become a very disagreeable person and is trying to find his way back to humanity. And based on that, we, we, we set the show uh, around the fringes of Paris, mostly in the Northeast. I don't if you know Paris, the 18th and 19th and 20th arrondissement, and the banlieue, the suburbs, which are not like American suburbs, the suburbs outside of the highway that encircles Paris, which is where the projects are. Um, and we made all of the French characters, all the main French characters be of uh, North African descent or Sub-Saharan African descent. And this was, um, so the, the challenge was building a world that we had to keep authentic, even though we weren't French. And um, we relied very heavily, obviously, on our French partners. Um, but it was enormously rewarding because when we, we thought we were showing a Paris that hadn't been seen by American audiences or UK audiences, but in, in making the show, our fantastic French crew 
would frequently come up to us and say, you know, this is a Paris that we've never seen on French television. The, the networks don't go here. Um, and so that's when I knew we had made something that was um, really original. And that was probably the most rewarding feedback that we got. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about this, the particular challenges of each of these shows. And, and it occurs to me that one, you know, another thing that, that Michelle and Derek have in common is that your show features an actor who's playing twins that are often in the same scene together. Um, and so I, I wonder for, for the two of you, how does that complicate both the planning and the shooting of those scenes? Oh, I think that... Um the director who came in for episode four, Mikkel Norgard, ended up being our producing director and he had the hardest episode. He had the twins and he had them underwater in a pool. And so the first, <laughs> the first day he showed up, I was just like, welcome <laughs> and I'm sorry. Um, and uh, it, it was always, everybody prepared for twin days. You know, it just took a, a, a little bit more time but the thing that was great about it is that Lizzie Kaplan is such a pro. And, you know, I was so grateful for the three, you know, leads that I had because they were always prepared. And that took so much pressure off the pressure of shooting. We didn't have to stop for, you know, someone to learn the lines or do anything else. And she was learning two characters and she really made them different. Um, the first day that she was in the blonde wig for one of the twins, I walked right past her. And so it was just kind of fun to watch that. And previous to this, I'd been on shows that were room heavy with not a lot of set um, you know, experience. So for me, it was just wonderful to watch it. And I think that probably by episode eight, everyone was just massively exhausted. <laughs> All right. Derek? Yeah, I mean, yeah for you know, one of the, the very first conversation I had with Mark, I thought to myself, okay, how do we do twins without it being a technical trick? Um, because I don't want the technical side of it to get in the way of what we were doing. And I started to think, okay, when these two guys were born, they were identical. They looked exactly the same. But when we meet them, they're 40 something years old. And so they have 40 years of life experience, of choices, of consequence. One of the twins is schizophrenic. So he's on some medication. And I know people that have been on medication that have gained weight. And so, I told Mark that if I was going to do it, we would have to enable this process where we wouldn't shoot the same twins on the same day. In fact, we ended up shooting 16 weeks of Mark as one twin, and then he went away for six weeks. He gained 30 pounds, and then we came back to the same location. Sometimes, you know, the, the big challenge was to shoot a driving scene, for instance, in a car where one side was shot in April and the other side was shot in September. And to have that continuity between the two characters. And still, I, I, you know, one of the things I'm most interested in as a, as a filmmaker is behavior, behavior of people, not just a performance, but finding behavior. And one of the things that, that uh, you know, that happened when Mark put on this weight gain is that he embodied, completely embodied a, a completely different person and it it changed who he was on a molecular level really and uh, you know I, I I had to cast my good friend Gabe Fazio to play opposite Mark and both and all those scenes so he would have someone that he could actually improvise with and it was it was a technical challenge but when I wanted when I saw when people saw it I didn't want them ever to think that there was any strain or any challenge to doing it. I just wanted them to get lost in those two characters and those two people. And the only thing I'll say is when Mark Ruffalo's dad first saw the trailer to our show, he asked Mark, he said, looks great. Who'd you get to play your brother? <laughs> so <laughs> I took that as, as a compliment. Yeah. Well, let's, Stephen, let's go back to you and to, and back to, Episode six, which is the one that was mentioned before. I mean, it, it starts with an old a TV show that you've recreated. It has a lot of flashback sequences in black and white. It has a fight scene that's set just to percussion. Um, you know, it, it jumps back and forth a lot as it's, as it's telling the story. I mean, it strikes me that that must have been, as a director, you know, 
an extremely challenging episode to put together. Uh, yeah, I mean, it all starts with the script. Uh, you know, Damon Lindelof and Cord Jefferson wrote um, an amazing uh, episode that was essentially the origin story uh, of, a, of a character called Hooded Justice. And uh, there were, for sure, certain technical aspects to the piece that that were that required a lot of pre-planning and and forethought uh but fortunately just the way in which we work together again you know um i've mentioned this before but uh it bears repeating you know uh damon and i've worked uh with each other before so there's a certain kind of understanding and trust level so the construction of the script along with you know uh, that Damon and Cord uh, put together was informed in many ways by discussions and conversations that we had uh, together about how what the specific visual vocabulary of that of that episode was going to going to be like, and um, it was the right kind of challenge insofar as we were at every turn exhilarated by the prospect of telling this particular story in the specific way in which we did, but equally terrified that it would be a uh, complete and utter disaster. And we rode the margin between those two uh, emotions throughout the entire making of, of that piece. And uh, in many ways, that's a kind of, you know, energizing place to be. I'm sure uh, all the other members of, of, of the panel are very familiar with that with uh, that space of, of terror and, and self-doubt. And uh, sometimes it can be a burden, but sometimes it's the right kind of impetus that you need to uh, stretch into something that feels um, true and honest. And uh, that was, yeah, that's how, you know, that was the approach. I could bore you with technical aspects of, of, uh, <laughs> of the endeavor, but... Um, <laughs> you would have to specifically invite me to do that because I'm <laughs> trying, desperately trying not to be burdensome to both the okay. panel and the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, Alan, you directed the last two episodes of, of the Eddie and the final episode, you, you pulled off this remarkable trick of having a very satisfying final episode that leaves almost everything hanging. Doesn't wrap up any plot lines really. Uh -huh. But but it feels like it's a satisfying conclusion. I mean, was that was that a tricky thing to pull off? Uh, well, thank you, Steve. That's, <laughs> you, you made my day. But um, <laughs> yeah, we wanted we wanted it to feel like a close. But it, this is not a show that asks for resolution. It's a show about people who are essentially leading very difficult lives and finding solace and joy in the music that they are creating together. So any kind of really, you know, tying things up wouldn't work. And also uh, we'd love to have a second season. Um, so it's that trick, which I, I think a lot of people here have experience where you have to do a season ender that may or may not be a series ender and you're gonna try and hit both points. Um, but in this case, uh, I think that what we wanted, the one thing that we wanted that would, the only thing that could really resolve was uh, Elliot's relationship with Julie. That's Andre Holland's character and Amanda Stenberg's character who you saw in the clip because they start off very, their father and daughter, they start off very, very much at odds. And really the, the main love story of the entire season is their learning how to understand and respect each other and and seed each other the space that allows for growth and then come back together and um that we wanted everybody's heart to be full with that and otherwise just to be able to feel the celebration of the band together and so i mean it was really jack thorne's genius idea which was that for the last scene that um there's a lot of crime bomb you know, there's a lot of plot stuff that happens, but the club in which they've been playing all season is suddenly shut down and taken away from them. And they they feel that they have to play. And so they just go out into the streets of Paris and begin playing. And the final number is them playing out in the streets. And um, I feel like it does accomplish the sense of it. You, you, you haven't seen them outdoors. You haven't seen them really in a Paris that looks like Paris. And now they're suddenly 
playing outside of cafes. Um, so I think it's something new um, and something that is brings a new level of um, of joy and and of it, you know they're all, all all embracing vision of the world into that one corner in Paris. But um, it was a logistical nightmare. And I won't like I don't want to bore you with all the details, but you know one of the one of the principles of the show, one of the pieces of bedrock, was that we all the music was recorded live. We never did playback. Wow. Um, and because it's partly because we wanted it to be authentic, and we had Glenn Ballard there, and he wrote all the songs. And the second thing is the the, the shooting style that we developed that really was more Damien's development, but was to do something that was kind of an amalgam of. French New Wave and John Cassavetes. And so we were improvising a lot and just following the characters around. So it was always handheld and very loose. Every take was different. And in a situation like that, you can't be doing playback because they have to be playing live every time because you never know exactly what you're gonna capture, but whatever you capture, that's what's in the frame. So we had settled this up for ourselves and then suddenly we were, they were doing a 200, no, a 100 yard long serenade in a crowded street in Paris that we were trying to record live. And they didn't have all their instruments, so they were like shaking cans and banging on pots and things. Um, and so it was a brilliant idea Jack had. It nearly gave me a heart attack in executing it. But <laughs> but if you say it's a satisfying end to the season, I'm actually very happy, and I hope there will be more. Right. Yeah. So, Paul, I, I know that you've said that the goal of season two was to just make more funny episodes. But I mean, were there particular challenges in, in you know, coming back to that world and doing it again? Um, no, we did paint ourselves into a corner at the end of the first season by making the, the vampires familiar. Guillermo, who's their little assistant who they treat terribly, discover that he's actually has vampire killer blood and in his in his uh heritage so we had no idea what we were going to do with we ended season two season one on that and didn't know what we were going to do with season two but then we ended up i think by painting ourselves into a corner forcing ourselves to come up with a very interesting story about how he's torn between the vampires he loves even though they treat him terribly and the fact that he's a natural born vampire killer um and uh uh yeah and then the other challenge was uh, what two people have already covered. We did an episode where each of the vampires acted opposite themselves as their own ghosts. So we did uh, actors playing two parts, but four times within one episode. And uh, when I watch uh, the 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 samples from the other shows, I know what a nightmare it is, but fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, th I think we, I hear we've got lots of uh, good audience questions. So um, maybe it's time for somebody else to start asking questions. So here's from Muggs Cahill. As a showrunner, do you feel like you have to give up some of your writing for the producer side, or is it simply a matter of being better at balancing two jobs? I feel like all of us here are writers slash produce. I mean, isn't it all part of the same thing at a certain point? I don't know. I, I, someone else should answer better, probably. I think there's a, <laughs> at some point where you have to give up part of the process of writing. So I let my writers take it as far as they can through the network notes, the producer's notes, and everything else. And then for the final polish, maybe come in there. Because if I did every single step, then I would you know, end up in the ER. So there's a way to just kind of like figure out what part of the process that you could share with others and then keep both hats on. I think the biggest thing about being a first time showrunner this year, besides not realizing there were so many questions in the world, was the um, idea of trying to figure out what to give away, what to keep, how much I could do, and then acknowledging that I could not do everything. So yes, there is a part of the writing side that I did have to put um, aside, but I had really great writers both seasons, and that was helpful. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Um, how did you each decide what streamer to pitch the project to? Did you target a single streamer or network, I guess, or go out to the mall? If you went to the mall, did you organize this through an agency? Uh, practical advice. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, you go uh, to all of them, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. And, you yeah. and uh, <laughs> I mean, with, in my experience, we got rejected by all of them, except for HBO. So, I mean, you know, there's one, you know, yeah. When you're making a film or a series or whatever you believe in, part of the job is to, you have to believe in it so much, right? You have to will it into life because it's not going to exist unless you believe in it. And, and every person that surrounds you, they start to orbit that belief and they believe in something that's greater than all of us. And, and to me, that's just the process of making something, you know, especially this collaborative process that is filmmaking. You know, you, 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 you start as an entity, an idea forms, and then it's just more and more people, you know, gravitate to it. And that could take 20 years to get people to gravitate to something. It could take, you know, there's, there's an indeterminate amount of time. Um, and rejection is just part of the game. Truly. We went out uh, to, we went out for two weeks and we pitched to most of the streamers and networks um, and we had our wish list and our top choices, but we gave it all at every single place that we were at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, to, was somebody else about to? No, I was just going to say ours was different in the, that Scott Rudin saw Jermaine and Tyka's movie and said, this should be a TV show. And Jermaine and Tyka said, ah, I don't know. Do we really want to do a TV show? And so they had to be dragged to do it. But then uh, <laughs> FX was very excited about it. And slowly they built some sort of enthusiasm for it. <laughs> All right. So um, here's another. Many showrunners say that being a showrunner is a job you learn to do as you go. What would be your biggest lessons as you learned how to be the showrunners you are today? It's true. It's learning as you go. Um, even with all the experience that you could have in TV, there's just it is very different to you know be in a writer's room, focus on the writing, focus on pitching, focus on research, and then go to set where you're hiring entire departments, talking with the new directors that are coming in, overseeing the cast, and it all stops with you. So you can be prepared, but you very much learn as you go because there's something new every day. There's a new situation and it's completely different from sitting in a writer's room, debating snacks and lunch to being on set and watching all the different things that are going on and trying to keep control of it all. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have specific lessons? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Michelle says. And I would say one of my, you know, seminal experiences was Six Feet Under and on that show, uh, we paid a lot of attention to making sure the writers could carry their weight as producers. And we insisted that the writers always be on set for their episodes and that they be studying breakdowns and learning the craft of being a producer and not just be, you know, uh, no, I think he should read the line a different way. Not that that's what people do, Michelle, but you know, you know what I mean, reductively. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think it is something that you, the most important thing is being open to learning the production side of the trade. And, you know, on Six Feet Under, I think, I think that every one of the writers who was in that room has gone on to become a showrunner. So I feel like we were at least starting them in the right direction. It's good. That's fallen away, but that used to be the standard where you produce your episode and you know, and then there's someone there who knows the piece of the story that hasn't been, um, the actors not, are not aware of yet whatever else is going on, but that's fallen away a little bit with shorter orders, smaller rooms and everything else. But on truth be told, all our writers go to set. They sit in on the production meeting, the tone meeting, casting, um, so that they know all of these things. And then it was great. We had people come in and I felt comfortable enough to be honest about what I didn't know. So, you know, and there were great people. There are people that would take advantage of that, but we had really great people season one and now season two. And I would just straight up say, walk me through that. Tell me what that is. And then I will, you won't have to do it a second time, but educate me here. And um, so there are things that, you know, if I, if I didn't admit that, I think there would be a lot more mistakes, but just being honest about what I didn't know and trusting the people that I hired to actually collaborate. I've always done the same thing as far as making sure the writers are on set, especially for their episodes, or as much as possible, because it, it benefits you in two ways. One of which is the next season, they're able to take more of the load and make more of the decisions and start producing. And it also, I think, makes them better as writers because they see all the 
75 percent of other bullshit that's involved that goes into it and it's not as easy as sitting in the room and going well why can't we have this scene with 150 people it'd be funnier you know it i think it helps their writing and as, and the training also helps them as future producers yeah. okay um from rachel for steven specifically and everyone in general talk about your visual approach to the material in terms of storytelling and for steven specifically the hallucinatory storyline um, for me, uh, the kind of approach to telling a story always starts with character, always starts with uh, trying to figure out how best to connect the audience with uh, the character's journey through the narrative, how to remove as much as possible the distance between the experiences that the character is having and the viewer so that of course is different in every you know for every story that you're telling and every character and every piece that you're approaching um you know as it pertains to uh to this episode that i think you're referring to when you're asking about the hallucinatory storyline i should also say that we were very very fortunate in that we were working with hbo who gave us the time and the resources necessary to uh, build an approach to telling this story in the way that it currently appears. Uh, and by that, I mean, we had enough time in prep to, I took the stand-ins uh, and a very, very small crew uh, to all the locations and we shot the episode. And then I edited the episode, looked at it, made some adjustments, backfilled those adjustments to Damon and Cord, who in turn uh, adjusted the script. I went back and I did the same thing again. Uh, the stand-ins knew the script inside and out, uh, and they were amazing. And uh, I shot it a second time uh, until I was happy with some of the technical specifics of the particular visual grammar that we were deploying to tell the story, um, most relevantly as it pertains to the transitions through scenes and between characters. So that by the time we brought the cast and the main crew uh, to each of the scenes, we had a really, really clear visual template of how we were gonna approach that. There was still room on the day for everybody to, for things to be discovered and, uh, new choices to be made. But for the most part, we were anchored by uh, having that um, that template. And and it turned out to be an amazing way to approach this particular episode. And and, and as you asked, uh, the hallucinatory storyline, um, you know, and the, the, the crew and the cast were so thoroughly invested in uh, doing um, justice and honor to this to this particular story. So that's how we approached it. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to add anything about visual approach? Um, I could just say that the way we shot the Eddie is kind of the opposite of the visual approach I've taken in my other work. It was because we, uh, because we wanted to have the sense of the extemporaneous and the idea that mistakes might be made and you would see them or things could go wrong. Um, we just sort of decided early on that we were going to follow the actors around and that we weren't going to worry about continuity and we weren't going to worry about editing and we weren't going to worry about which side of the line we were on. And we um, kind of threw out the rule book that way. Um, and that was scary because there are certain principles of film grammar that you kind of take as gospel when you're a director. And uh, it ended up being a very freeing experience and it ended up benefiting the end product enormously. And, um, when we had mistakes in a scene, like something wouldn't cut the way something should be cut in an orthodox manner, uh, we just found another way. It's not right for every material, but because of the storytelling of this particular series, it was the right way to go. We had a visual style for each storyline. So there were three different looks going on in the show. For Aaron Paul's character, who's in prison, it's very blue and stark and a little icier. For uh, Octavia's character, when she's in Marin in this very 
um, you know, fancy world that she lives in. It's very bright and upbeat. And then when she's in Oakland with her family, it has a very Jeep joint kind of bluesy look to it. And we had a score and a soundtrack that matched each one of those visual looks. So we set out to do that from the beginning, just so you could see these three uh, fractured families. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, go uh, for, for Paul, Taika Waititi is one of my favorites. How much creative freedom do you give him for this show? Is there a lot of improv? Um, Taika directed, I think, two episodes in the first season. Uh, and he and Jermaine both have the same sort of directorial style, which they, I think, perfected by do it, doing the movie, which is ton, ton, a lot of improv from the actors. And as long as we hit the main story points we want to hit, you know, we hit them. But um, there's a ton of improv. And by the time it comes to the editing room, I can't remember what we wrote and what they came up with which is also a credit to the actors for knowing their characters so well. Uh, it's also much easier to, to uh, incorporate improv on a show like this, which has such a strict documentary style, because we can just jump cut, we can trim things out. Uh, you know, if you would, some, some, it makes it feel even more like a documentary, the fact that we're jumping around. All the things that, that Alan, was do, we, Alan was doing on his show, we try to make it look like we're actually there just following some vampires around and letting what happens happen. Um, and sometimes you have to work hard to make it look like, I mean, if there's a building exploding behind you, you have to make it look like, oh, the cameraman didn't know that was gonna happen and they're just gonna capture it. But uh, I mean, our special effects and our stunts are very uh, heavily rehearsed and planned and scripted, but, but within that, there's a ton of uh, improvisation from all the actors. Right. Okay. Uh, for Derek, did you find it tough to adapt the book into this show? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, I mean, maybe we all agree on this. I mean, for me, shooting the show, making the show is like being on vacation. Like working is vacation. It's the time between working that's hard. Like the time trying to get something going, that's the that's the struggle as a as a filmmaker. It's like when you're when you're actually making something, that's what you're living for. It's those moments, at least for me, to be on set, to be working with actors, and you know, to to be writing something, and then eventually to you know to be in the editing room. You know, one thing I'll say about like you know, for me, six years. So I was writing this thing before I was able to get on set. Right, five six years. Every day that I'm not shooting, I'm thinking about it. I'm stuck in my head. It's like imagining the screen of what I'm going to be seeing. Visualization, right? And so for me, when I get on set, the last thing I want to do is see what I've been seeing in my head for these last... I'm, I'm so bored with what I've been seeing in my head. Now I have a crew. Now I have actors. Now I have other artists around me that can that can show me something new and surprise me. And so... To me, that's the thrill of being alive. That's what, and as filmmakers, like how much, how much time of our lives do we actually spend on set? It's not that much. I mean, I'm, I know this much is true. We sh shot 116 days. We didn't really board it out like a show. We just, I just shot it basically like, to me, it was a long form movie. Um, but it's 116 days over the course of six years. It's a very rare experience. So it's, it's precious, you know? And so, I don't know, on day one, when I talked to the crew, I, th I, 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 I told them a speech. Of, my mom had told me when she, when she was raising me, she said that sometimes on a Saturday morning, she would think about all the stuff she had to do that day. And she would just think about getting to the end of the day. And, and she said, now that she's in her seventies, she just wishes she could go back and enjoy one of those days and not look forward to getting it over with. And so I told the crew on day one, I was like, we're not going to count down. We have 116 days to shoot this. Let's not say 115 days left or 99 days left. Let's say day one and treat every day like a birthday. And every day is a celebration. We're here together. We're making something. We'll never be back here again. And now I'm a year removed. We're all in lockdown. Sometimes I just look at my phone and just go to the photos app and see where I was a year ago today. And it was like the greatest time of my life. So tough, 
relentless, I would say, is uh, relentless and a joy would be the way I would describe it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for Alan, what was the hardest part about directing a musical drama? Um, as, as I kind of alluded to, the fact that all the music was live meant that we had to be basic, basically it was if we were putting on a live show, we were recording that live show to make a, like a, you know, a record quality album and we were filming it at the same time. So it was, it was happening in the space. It was happening in the recording studio that was built into the space. And of course it was happening on camera. So there were just, uh, for a show where we were trying to be spontaneous and handheld and let anything happen, there were uh, an awful lot of wheels spinning. What, what we did um, to make it work is the, sh the show was all shot on practical locations in Paris, in a lot of small rooms and out on the streets and in the projects. But for the jazz club, we took an old abandoned movie studio and we built the jazz club as a set inside the walls. It's our one set. And by doing that, we were able to actually build a recording studio so that it, it looks very much like a jazz club, but there are miles and miles of cables that are leading back to a command center uh, off stage where we had a team of engineers working so that when we were recording live, we had to make sure that it was, that it was, uh, you know, professional quality recording at the same time that the, the players would stop and start, the actors would interrupt them, they would do a scene. So um, usually when you do a musical, you're, you're shooting the playback. You pre-record the songs in advance and uh, a lot of the time, the band and the, and the, the vocalist are, are miming to make sure that it comes out perfect and that the sound is perfect. And we didn't afford ourselves that luxury. So the toughest thing was making it all work live and, um, and yet making it sound good on everybody's home theater or iPhone. Which, whichever they were listening on. How did so, you keep? How did you keep the uh, tempo steady between different takes? Or uh, Randy Kerber, who, who's the pianist in the band, and who was actually the pianist in the original band that Glenn put together seven years ago, um, and was our musical director. As the pianist, he had a click track because they, it was always he set the tempo. He would count yeah. them down. He would set the tempo, and he had the click, but only he had it. And it was such a great band that they were always able to keep it within a millisecond. Wow. Okay. So we've got a question for Nichelle. Um, love the show. I've read that the series was inspired by the career of Sarah, Sarah Koenig. Did you speak to Sarah directly for research or how did you prepare for this? Well, the, the sh uh, thank you, Zoe. The show was based on a novel that had a podcast at its center. And um, so it wasn't necessarily based on Sarah directly, but Sarah was a consultant for the show. And she was great. She was very helpful. I think she was horrified by what we did with journalism, but, <laughs> but that was the point. We just, I really wanted to have a, um, a, uh, a reporter who gets so involved in the story and she breaks the first rule of journalism by making it personal. And then she just goes down this road that's kind of buck wild for lack of a better word. So I think that there were points where Sarah probably like, buried her head in the sand, but she was great. She was a consultant from the very beginning for us. Okay, well, I guess, I think this is the last question and it's for Stephen. What you made, what made you decide to use the Tulsa Massacre as the storyline for the whole series? Um, well, uh, I, I can't honestly take credit for that decision. <laughs> that decision was made by, uh, by Damon uh, Lindelof as, um, you know, he was, uh, reading, I think in, I want to say in 2017, 2017, he was reading an essay called, uh, the case for reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates that was published first in, uh, the Atlantic and then later gathered, collected in a, in a series of, of essays in another book. Uh, and, he encountered the Tulsa massacre uh, for the first time um, in his recollection, uh, this massacre that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, uh, resulted in the destruction of what was then known as the Black Wall Street, uh, a thriving black community uh, in Tulsa. And it occurred to him that if he was going to nestle 
uh, that event at the core of uh, a reiteration of of Watchmen and th that was set in in the near near future or near present that in much the same way that the destruction of you know uh, the planet Krypton was the kind of birth moment for uh, for Clark Kent slash Superman. So to this event could become the catalyst to set uh, all the pieces of the narrative puzzle that became our, our iteration of Watchmen in, into play. And um, just from a purely story level, obviously there are, you know, uh, huge um, issues attached to, to that event in, in American history. And the reverberations are still being felt to this day, but the trauma that that event um, occasioned for uh, for a character at the center of our piece called Will Reeves, um, that was the that that was the, the the real kind of kernel at the heart of of, of the story that mm -hmm. Damon shows that you know turns out to be um, that worked uh, obviously within the context of our story and it has you know, as people have continued to excavate uh, that portion of American history that has been uh, buried and um, left in the shadows for many people, uh, has the, as, as that, has, that event has come to life along with many others in, in, in recent times, in recent days and years, um, it's acquired a particular resonance and refracted off the construction of Watchmen, our series, in a way that we certainly hadn't imagined, but that are um, satisfied uh, is is now finally being seen for what it is and um, being examined and explored and, and all the ramifications that came from that event. Right. Well, I think we need to wrap up with, with that, but, um, you know, Thanks to everybody on the panel for joining us. Thanks for everybody in the audience who's looking. Um, if you want to go to more of these, uh, check out the free trial to Wrap Pro. We'll tell you about these before anybody else. And um, panelists, thank you all so much for, for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck for everyone.